Hi folks, uh, my name is Bruce Coran. I'm the uh, Vice Chair of the Mitchell Historical Society. I'm also a friend of Jack Dellinger and a volunteer here at the Dellinger Mill, which is where we are this morning. And with me is Jack Dillinger, who is the uh, uh, fourth generation miller, owner, operator of Dellinger Mill. And we're going to do basically a virtual tour of the mill. We're going to tell you about the mill. We're going to tell you about its history, the history of the family, a little bit of Jack's personal history. And then we're going to show you the mill in operation. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, uh, how, how are you doing this morning, Jack? I'm doing very well, Bruce. Thank you. Okay. Well, why don't you go ahead and just start, uh, you were saying a minute ago, that why don't I just start by telling us, telling folks what I normally say about the mill when we started the tour. So go ahead. You're okay. On. Well, folks, you have come to a very historic place. There are three things that make this mill unique and historic. Number one. In 1998, the mill and the property surrounding the mill entered into the National Register of Historic Places as the last grist mill of its kind left in the state of North Carolina. Okay, number two. It's been in the Dellinger family now for over 150 years and it was founded and operated by my great-grandfather Reuben Dellinger. I'll give you more detail about him later. And he passed on in 1895 and Grandpa Dave took over. I remember Grandpa Dave real well, and I, I can talk for an hour and a half about him, but you won't stand for that. But anyway, he passed on in 1936, and then my daddy Marv, he took over, and he ran the mill until he died in 1955. Okay, so Jack, um so now you're working for IBM, and uh, IBM is going to program the Saturn V rocket. So, um, and, uh, so you moved to Huntsville, is that right? That is correct. Now, at first we had rented space at the Brown Engineering Building. And we worked on some pre hollow stuff, Gemini, for instance, but eventually we had to convince Dr. Werner von Braun that a digital computer could put people on the moon. Now, during World War II, of course, he used analog computers for his V-2 rockets. And he thought we ought to go analog, but it's like an analog, analog computer as big as this building to do what you had to do to put the guys on the moon. Okay, so we built a computer with triple redundant circuitry. Had voting circuits all over the place and everything was triple redundant. Now, there were four people bid on this contract along with us. We set our computer up out there in Astronics Lab at, at NASA, and six months later, it was the only one left running with zero errors. Von Braun was convinced. So he called up Ed Smythe. Ed was our chief engineer. And Ed and he had a conversation. Von Braun told Ed, says, I'm convinced your computer is good, 
and said, now it's time to start on that software. And I only want six engineers working on this software. And they've got to have certain attributes. Number one, they've got to have patience and persistence, three or four other things. And he said, I hear tell that you've got an engineer over there who was named for a mule. Or they got around to IBM and I guess drifted to NASA. But I, he said, I want somebody who is stubborn on this team. So that's how I got on the team to write software. Now then, I could tell you all about that computer, but I won't <laughs> bore you to death. Okay. Okay, so now we worked 10 hour days, seven days a week for about two years. After that, we weren't worth shooting. But anyway, the perks to that, we got to meet all the Apollo astronauts. They wanted to go to the moon, but they wanted to come back too. So, July 1968, here come Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong. Well, I had people working for me by then, so I took them around, started introducing them. They got pats on the back, you know, do a good job, so on and so forth. But Buzz is a talker. I think he's still alive. Of course, Neil's passed on. But uh, anyway, Buzz just took over. Now, he had a PhD in engineering physics from somewhere up in the Northeast. And so he was going into great detail about everything. And when he got to talking about inverting matrices within matrices, Neil and I snuck off in the corner and talked common sense. <laughs> okay. So, anyway, that night, along about 5 o'clock, I took off early for some reason, Neil walked out the door with me. Well, it was hot. It was probably 105 degrees out there. Even the asphalt on the parking lot was bubbling. But Neil kept walking alongside me for about 100 yards. And he had parked his rental car alongside of mine. His rental car from the airport. And he was flying commercial. So he looked at his big fancy watch and he said, Jack, I've got two hours and 40 minutes to kill for my flight. So you got any ideas? I said, yeah, Neil, there's a beer joint over here called the Red Carpet, and they have draft beer. He said, let's go. <laughs> well, I guess that's the most Neil ever talked in his life. He got to telling me about training on that lunar lander down in Arlington, Texas. It was built to fly at one-sixth Earth gravity, and he said you had to learn to fly all over again. So, anyway, one of them headed for the ground and he couldn't stop it, so he bailed out and an artillery shell sent him 500 feet in the air so his chute would open. Okay. So, end of Apollo. I was there for all 18 flights. And then they started shutting the place down. The work for a space shuttle was being done in Houston, Texas. Well, I've been to Houston. It's too big, too hot, too humid. And I heard that they had built a factory to build PCs and program them in Raleigh-Durham, Research Triangle Park one of the first occupants in that park. So I went up there and interviewed 
And the guy kind of laughed. And he said, well, if you can help put a guy on the moon, I guess you can work on PCs. So, third. Now, number three, and most important. This mill today runs the same as it did in 1859 when Great Grandpa Rubin was running it. And I used the same water wheel, the same gears, and the same pulleys, and the same millstones, and the same techniques that all my ancestors used. And I'm the fourth generation miller. After Daddy died, the mill sat here idle for 42 years. You couldn't even see it from up here on the road. It had grown up so much. And thank goodness the road down here did not exist. So most of the original equipment was here. Well, Jack, why don't we uh, talk a little bit about how the mill uh, came to be here uh, in the first place? Okay. Okay. First of all, I need to tell you about Reuben's parents. Henry, or some folks called him Heinrich, because the Delger family is from Germany, and they carried over some of the German names. And Henry was the son of Johann Philip Delger, who changed his name to John, who fought at King's Mountain and Count Capians and Ramsaurus Mill in the Revolutionary War. We still Avery, a prominent lawyer down in Morganton, used to own all of Avery County. He was a wealthy man. And what he was doing with that mountain land up along the Linville River he was running a herd of cattle up there back in the 1700s and he needed somebody to look after his cattle. So he hired Henry to go up there and camp out all summer long, salt his cattle and take care of them. Well, Henry got to liking it so well up there because it's much cooler than Morganton that he decided he'd like to have a piece of land. So according to my daddy, Moore, he bought 600, Henry bought 600 acres of land along Linville River for 10 cents an acre. Now, I don't know if that was a good deal. So it sure sounds like it today, but anyway, he went up there and, of course, started a real good farm. And, of all things, he set up a grist mill driven by a wooden wheel. And he and his wife, Catherine, had 14 youngins. They didn't have any slaves. They raised their own. So... <laughs> One of those 14, one of the youngest ones, was Ruby. Now Henry taught his whole family, and probably including the girls, how to run a grist mill and how to uh, operate one, even how to build one. Okay, so there's that old gene popping up again. And now, Reuben was determined to outdo his daddy. He had heard somehow through the grapevine that they were building steel wheels up in New Hanover, Pennsylvania. So, now, I wish I had asked daddy a million questions, but since I was a teenager, I didn't do it. Okay, I should have asked him how much did Reuben pay for that steel wheel? 
1859. I have no idea. I'm sure it was a good sum of money. Well, where did he get the money from? He probably sold some land because that land got divided up 14 ways. Uh, <laughs> he probably didn't have a whole lot of property over there on Lambeau River, but he went ahead and ordered from the Fitz Water Wheel Company a steel wheel. This steel wheel right here was built in 1859 in New Hanover, Pennsylvania. Well, that wheel weighs four tons, 8,000 pounds. How do you bring a four ton water wheel from New Hanover to Morganton, North Carolina, the nearest railroad station. Well, Mr. Fitz thought of everything. So, that, that wheel is 12 feet in diameter, 30 inches wide. It wouldn't exactly fit on a railroad car. So Mr. Fitz took it apart or put it together so that you have eight 500 pound pieces. Now, that doesn't include the gears and the pulleys. So, anyway, that's the story of the water wheel. So, now, the mill, back when uh, Reuben started the mill, you're over, he's over by the Linville River. We're not, this is, this is definitely not the Linville River. This is Cane Creek. So how is it that the mill uh, ended up over here uh, as opposed to where it started off? That's a very good question, Bruce, because the reason it's over here was due to the death of my great-grandmother, Reuben's wife. Her name was Mary Jane Coffey Dellinger. Now, I have a good record of what happened over there where, mill, where Reuben had set up his mill on Camp Creek where it empties into Liverpool River. He was competing with his daddy, but evidently there was a lot of corn being ground around there. so. It wasn't a problem. Now, a miller's wife is supposed to be able to grind corn when the man is off hunting or fishing or plowing a field or something else around the farm. So, Uncle Jake Carpenter kept a diary of all the goings on over there around Linville River. I have a copy of that diary. And in there, Uncle Jake wrote, April 15, 1859. Mary Jane Coffey Dellinger, age 31, were killed in Grisville. Her tri the belt came off <clears throat> the pulley here, and back then the pulley was located close to those gears, and a breeze came up, and she had not turned the water off because to turn a, a four-ton water wheel takes a great deal of effort, and I'll do it today. I'm guilty of letting the water continue to run <coughs> and put the, <coughs> the belt back on the pulley. Evidently, and there was no one there to verify this, her, they wore long dresses that went down to the ground back then, made of linsey woolsey, which would not tear. And so when the belt came off, she came out here and tried to put it on, 
and a breeze came up and blew her dress into those gears right there. And naturally, she was crushed flat. Uncle Jake wrote, she lay there for three hours. I hope pull her out. Well, according to my daddy Moore, folks were still talking about that accident over there two years later. So Reuben has some young, he had four sons, he and Mary Jane, and one daughter. And he wanted to get them away from hearing about Mary Jane's death. So he came across the mountain up here and he bought this side of the mountain, that side of the mountain, and the acreage around the mill here from Thomas Pittman for 100 acres for $100. Now, folks ask me if that's a good deal in 1959. I have no idea. Probably was well, not. But anyway, he and his four sons, and maybe his daughter, proceeded to move that water wheel and all the other equipment uh, across the mountain up here probably using oxen or horses and sled, wooden sled. And by 1867, he had a prominent farm here and the water wheel was turning and he was grinding corn for people. Well, back then, everybody had a cornfield. And everybody thought their corn was better than anybody else's. So this, this mill stayed pretty busy. And that main road to Bakersville, a lot of times people from over in present day Avery County, they would bring a bushel of corn to be ground and then go on to Bakersville, the county seat, and take care of what they needed to down there. And then they could pick up their cornmeal or grits, whatever, on their way back across the mountain. Now, Jack, just so we're clear, we're, we're, uh, this mill is sits situated right off of Cane Creek Road. But Cane Creek Road, at the time when the mill existed, it was really a dirt road that ran essentially uh, really to the left of where we are. And it, it just, as you said, it followed the creek into Bakersville? That's correct. Okay, so essentially you had to ford the creek at various places, and it was, it was, uh, but it it was it was passable. People could use it. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. Now, part of your taxes back then, since that road was maintained by Mitchell County, Daddy pulled his time on there, and part of your tax bill was to spend one day a month working on repairing the road. No doubt the road had lots and lots of ruts in it. And even today, it's a pretty good road for what's left of it. And you go to straighten it out, you found out it's mostly rock. <laughs> so, so uh Reuben, uh, Reuben lived uh, and was a miller until he died, which was in... Uh, uh, 1895. Okay. And uh, so uh, how, how is it that, uh, that, that uh, uh, his, his... How many kids did he have? He had four sons and one daughter. Now, uh, he worked all those four sons really, really hard. Putting that smell together, clearing land, working the farm. So two of them went back across the mountain over in Hanson's Creek, Uncle Hunter and Uncle Elkano, and they didn't want to work no more on this farm. But Uncle Melvin, or Uncle Mel, if everybody called him, 
he married a lady over here in the Green Cove. Uh, she was the daughter of Josiah uh, Green and she inherited a bunch of land over there. So Uncle Melvin had a pretty good farm over at Green Cove. Well, so that left, that left Dave. That left Grandpa Dave. So Reuben turned over. Well, he inherited all hundred acres of land and the mill. And now, I remember Grandpa Dave real good. I was about five or six when he passed away in 1936. But Grandpa Dave had to be a genius. He was also a benevolent dictator. His wife had passed on before he did and they raised 12 young'uns over here across the creek. Well, when his wife passed on and the, his children, a lot of them passed on from TB, then he moved in with us up here in the high room in the house across the road. Okay, now he was the boss. As I said, he was benevolent dictator. Now, his name, and why Reuben gave us so many names, I don't know. His name was David Roger Philip Dillinger. David Roger got abbreviated to DR by the post office. So he started receiving medical literature in the mail. Mama sued Buchanan Dillinger. She said he used to set up till midnight. We didn't have electricity then. But he would read those medical journals until midnight. But the important part was more than, I don't know if he understood a lot of the medical journal stuff, but he knew all about the rural herbs, barks, everything that would cure disease. So he became the MD for all of Cane Creek here. There wasn't one in Bakersfield at the time. Okay, so when people got sick, they called Dr. Dave. Now sometimes I'm sure he helped them out. But other times it's possible he hurried them on. <laughs> Just never know. Now he also got involved with dental stuff. Yes, right? he did. Now one day he received a dental catalog in the mail. So looking through there, he saw a picture of tooth pullers. He ordered himself a pair of tooth pullers. Well, he became a dentist. Now, his office was the front porch of the house up here. And when people would come to get a tooth pulled, he would lean a chair up under the weatherboarding so they w he wouldn't pull them out of the chair. And uh, there was a lot of hollering went on up there. It scared us kids to death. We, we were afraid of those tooth pullers real bad. But... Okay, now he was a real strict Baptist, so he would not let people have a little moonshine to kill the pain, but a lot, a lot of them came prepared, <laughs> and he wouldn't turn them away, <laughs> which was a good thing. Anyway, folks figured if he could help people when they were sick, he might be able to help animals. So he became a veterinarian. Okay. Now he was also a shoe. He also was a shoemaker. Made all the yes. shoes for the family. Yep. Now there's a chestnut oak that grows around here that we used to skin and sell as tan bark. These tanning factories that made shoes and so forth, they tanned that leather. 
Well, Grandpa and I, Dave, knew all about Chestnut Oak Park. So, right up here next to the road, there used to be about, oh, 20, 30 foot long trough lined with lumber. And in there, Grandpa Dave put layers of tan bark then layers of beef hide, and then during the winter, he'd uncover it, snow and all, and add whoosh uh, ashes from the fireplace and from the kitchen stove. And during the spring, he'd dig those sides up, they'd be tanned, but they were pretty rough, so he'd bring them down to the creek down here and scrape all the, until he had real good leather to work with. Now he made shoes for adults and for all us kids. And I was so ashamed that he would not buy me a pair of shoes out of the store up here at Hall. And I had to wear those wooden, or those homemade shoes which were real sturdy, up to Hawk University, <laughs> according to my first cousin, Joe Snyder. And that, that was the primary school. That's what primary you school, grades one through five. And I was so ashamed of those shoes. I used to try to put them under the desk or something. But I sure wish I had them today. They're better than the ones I got on. <laughs> now, it was, he was a postmaster too, wasn't he? He was. And they had a post office right here in the mill? Yeah. And Reuben was, I forgot to tell you, he was also a postmaster when he first started the mill up. So once a week when people came to get their corn ground, they could mail a letter or they could pick up their income in mail. No doubt they had a horseback rider who brought the mail up from Bikers. Right. Okay. So, uh, uh, so uh, your grand when your when your grandpa Dave passed on, your dad took over the mill. Is that right? That is correct. But I need to add one more thing about Grandpa Dave. Okay. When I was growing up, there used to be a sawmill here. In 1904, the railroad came into Tokang three miles down past uh, Bakersfield. And Grandpa Dave, there were great big old chestnut trees, still green, the blight hadn't hit, a huge forest of them over here on the mountain. So he knew the railroad would buy lumber. So he ordered himself a sawmill. When I was growing up, there was a four-foot circular saw set right here, and when they weren't uh, grinding corn, they would saw those big chestnut logs into lumber, and Daddy had, had a team of mules. He later moved up to horses, but I need to tell you a little story about those mules. We Dellingers are bad to name our animals after people. Well, the first dog I ever owned was named Reuben. Now, Daddy had also named one of his mules Reuben. That was okay, he had passed on. But I hadn't been born yet. So he named that other mule Jack. So I was probably named after a dad blame mule. And evidently I was a stubborn baby. <laughs> might, might have given him reason, who knows. But it came in handy later. I want to throw that in. Okay. So in 1936, Grandpa Dave passed away. And he was so respected out of this community, 
he died in February, and it was colder than the Dickens. I remember it well. There was a line of people lined up to be pallbearers and carry his casket from the house up to Cane Creek Church and the cemetery. They lined up all the way along that about a mile, mile and a half up there. And they told the church bell for every year he had lived. Okay. Now, enough. Of, if you want to read more about Grandpa Dave, I've written a book, and it contains the biggest chapter in there. And we'll, uh, when we, as we're wrapping this up, we'll we'll go ahead and show the book and show you grits and show you products and things that you that you that you have. But uh, so we'll we'll get to we'll we'll get to the book uh, at some point. <laughs> okay. Uh, so your dad took over. My dad took over. And Daddy, thank goodness, he sold the sawmill to Carl Wise, who ran it with an old steam engine. And for all I know, it's still running. <coughs> but anyway, <coughs> excuse me. Okay, now then. Grandpa, or D Daddy Marv, he continued to farm just like they did back in the 1800s. Okay, up here across the road, we had a sorghum cane patch. So we made molasses every fall. Next to that cane patch was a tater patch, potato patch. And so we had about 40 bushels of potatoes in a tater hole up there where they were kept all winter. And then came the house. And then a two acre garden. Well up above the two, two acre garden there was a oat field to feed the two horses that we had. Often accused Daddy of feeding the horses better than he fed us, us kids. And he said, yeah, and they work harder, too. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so, now, I didn't mind working here on the farm, up through high school. But when I got big enough, uh, in March of April of every year, we'd be sitting there at the breakfast table, and... So Daddy had looked across the table at me, and why he picked on me, I'll never know, because there were two other boys and four girls, and he said, Jack, after breakfast, I want you to go down there, harness up those two horses, and take them up take that turning plow with you and go up there and plow that 10 acre cornfield which was up here behind the house. Well that cornfield went up at least a 65 degree angle. Those horses wanted to come home and I did too. And that's where I learned how to cuss, taking lessons from daddy. <laughs> but anyway, it's about half rock and half dirt but it produced pretty good crop of corn. Well, I learned to hate that cornfield with a passion. So when I graduated high school, I didn't want any more to do with that cornfield. I had heard the Air Force recruiter came over from Asheville to Bakersfield on Wednesdays. Now, we didn't have a car at that time there were only three cars up here on Kern Cane Creek that I know of. Okay, so I walked down to Bakersfield, signed up for a four-year hitch in the Air Force. Well, I didn't see the Korean War coming, and so naturally basic training in Texas. Then they gave us an aptitude test, 
And I said, hmm, Dell's where you might make a pretty good airplane mechanic. So, in nine months of airplane mechanic school, Chinook Field, Illinois, 100 miles south of Chicago. Then, Korean War had started. Well, I wanted to stay in school if I could, stay out of Korea. And so, they had an opening in airplane electrician school, and I got in there for three months. And then, fortunately, I had a friend who had spent time in World War II. He was a master sergeant. He was in charge of the flight engineer school. But he said, one day, after I graduated the electrician school, he said, Jack, says, usually I only let people into the flight engineer school six months long, just highly ranked NCOs. But says, I'll make an exception. I have one opening left. Do you want it? Another six months in school? Yes, sir. I was working on fighter planes, and they were built by Lockheed. Well, they shipped them up there, and some of them didn't work exactly right. So they sent two aeronautical engineers to help us out. And so one day, one of those aeronautical engineers from Lockheed said, Sergeant Dellinger, I'd sure love to have a cold beer after work. I said, well, I'm an NCO now. We can go to the NCO club. We did. Subject salary came up. I was staff sergeant. And so anyway, I was making $110 a month. I thought, well, that sure beats hulling corn up here. Well, in 1952, the average salary for an engineer was around $5,000 a year. One of these guys was getting 10000 and the senior guy fifteen. I said, my God, you're rich. How do you do that? And they said, well, if you're going to have a GI Bill, go ahead and get yourself an engineering degree and Airplane companies will pay you pretty good. So I got discharged, went down to Raleigh, enrolled at NC State, and four years later had an electrical engineering degree. Well, in 1958, there was a recession on. Airplane companies didn't come around. They weren't hiring. And here came IBM. And IBM says, Don't you know, we elect your record, but we don't have a single opening for an electrical engineer. How would you like to be a computer programmer? I said, What's that? <laughs> anyway, North Carolina State did not have a computer at that time. We used slide rules in engineering school. But nine months later, in Poughkeepsie, New York, I became a computer programmer. My first assignment, Dayton, Ohio. We had a contract with the Foreign Technology Division. What that really meant was it was a spy outfit. And so I had to get a top secret clearance. Now, Dayton was too cold for me and my wife during the winter time. And it's pretty hot in the summer. So I kept pestering my bosses. I'd sure like to get a sow. Well, they thought Bethesda, Maryland was sow. Well, that was a bad move. Anyway, right. October 1963. There was a big notice went up on the bulletin board. Volunteers needed. It says, IBM wins $25 million contract from NASA to build the onboard computer for the Saturn V rocket and program it to put the Apollo astronauts on the moon 
located in Huntsville, Alabama, under direction of Dr. Werner von Braun, the German scientist. I, I didn't even call my wife up. I went running into my boss's office. I said, sign me up. He said, well, Jack, I hate to see you go, but if that's what you want to do, go ahead. Okay, so we moved to Huntsville in October 1963. And we spent 18 years there. Right. So, Jack, uh, so now you're working for IBM, and uh, IBM is going to program the Saturn V rocket. So, um, and, uh, so you moved to Huntsville, is that right? That is correct. We worked 10 hour days, seven days a week for about two years. After that, we weren't worth shooting. But anyway, the perks to that, we got to meet all the Apollo astronauts. They wanted to go to the moon, but they wanted to come back, too. So, July 1968, here come Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong. Well, I had people working for me by then, so I took them around, started introducing them. They got pats on the back, you know, do a good job, so on and so forth. But Buzz is a talker. I think he's still alive. Of course, Neil's passed on. But uh, anyway, Buzz just took over. Now, he had a PhD in engineering physics from somewhere up in the Northeast. And so he was going into great detail about everything. And when he got to talking about inverting matrices within matrices, Neil and I snuck off in the corner and talked common sense. <laughs> okay. So, anyway, that night, along about 5 o'clock, I took off early for some reason, Neil walked out the door with me. Well, that was hot. It was probably 105 degrees out there. Even the asphalt on the parking lot was bubbling. But Neil kept walking alongside me for about 100 yards. And he had parked his rental car alongside of mine. His rental car from the airport. And he was flying commercial. So he looked at his big fancy watch and he said, Jack, I've got two hours and 40 minutes to kill for my flight. So you got any ideas? I said, yeah, Neil, there's a beer joint over here called the Red Carpet, and they have draft beer. He said, let's go. <laughs> well, I guess that's the most Neil ever talked in his life. He got to telling me about training on that lunar lander down in Arlington, Texas. It was built to fly at one-sixth Earth gravity, and he said you had to learn to fly all over again. So, anyway, one of them headed for the ground and he couldn't stop it, so he bailed out and an artillery shell sent him 500 feet in the air so his chute would open. Okay. So, end of Apollo. I was there for all 18 flights. And then they started shutting the place down. The work for a space shuttle was being done in Houston, Texas. Well, I've been to Houston. It's too big, too hot, too humid. And I heard that they had built a factory to build PCs and program them in Raleigh-Durham, Research Triangle Park one of the first occupants in that park. So I went up there and interviewed, and the guy kind of laughed, and he said, well, if you can help put a guy on the moon, I guess you can work on PCs. In 1997, 
I retired from IBM Corporation and moved up here to the old home place well close by Makersville and uh, so anyway the mill where we are right now have been sitting here for 42 years since daddy died in 1955 and it took me 42 years to get back here well after retirement I, did, I tried to sit in a rocking chair and just read books and stuff like that but that didn't work so I had to be active doing something. Well, Daddy had left me half of the old 94-acre mountain farm, everything this side of the road, including the grist mill, and 44 acres across the creek. Well, one day I got curious about the old mill. And I wanted to check out my 44 acres in addition. So, I drove up here from Bakersville. And you couldn't even see the smell from up in the road. So, I had to park up across the road here. Beside the road. Crawled down through bushes, blackberry briars poison ivy and trees and I got down here to the mill and I took a look at it and I couldn't believe what I saw. That old water wheel which weighs four tons was sitting down in the ground at a 45 degree angle about three feet down in the ground, the pedestals, which were made out of creek rock and mortar, had given way, and so the water wheel was a pitiful sight to see. Well, in addition to that, the, the foundation, two great big old chestnut logs, underneath the mill had broken and it was 10 inches lower on this side than the upper side. In addition to that, I walked around to the mill flume and it had rotted out completely and then I walked up 200 yards to the mill dam and it had washed away during the frequent floods we have. And then I came back down here and I was standing beside that water wheel and I got this crazy notion. I'd sure like to see that water wheel turn again. And the more I thought about it, the more I went to do it. Well, I had a problem. I had promised my wife, Leslie, a big beautiful house over here across the creek where you could listen to the creek run at night and so I knew I could not do both not enough money so all the way back to Bakersville I thought how am I going to convince Leslie I should restore this mill Needless to say, we had about a four-hour discussion, and she was winning. But along about four o'clock, she gave up, and she says, Well, we have that house in Pensacola, Florida. Says, you just go ahead and restore your meal. So, given her permission, I started work with three, well, I went through three contractors. 
And three years later, I had this mill operational, and I ground the first bushel of corn in June of the year 2000, and it runs today in 2020, just like it did in the 1800s. All right, Jack, uh, we're looking at the wheel and the gears. Why don't you explain to us how that wheel turning, uh, that wheel turns and how that ends up grinding corn. Okay. Now, Mr. Fitz, who built this water wheel, he knew that you had to turn a millstone at 150 to 200 RPM. Well, he knew if he turned that water wheel that fast, it'd probably fly apart. So he made those 40 buckets. You see each section of them? They are a curvature. So no, no matter how much water you give that water wheel, it will only turn 10 to 15 RPM. Well, you can't grind corn at 10 to 15 RPM. So they put a four foot diameter bull gear on the same axle as the water wheel. Well, that, that thing is four feet in diameter. The little gear is a foot in diameter. So let's assume the water wheel is turning at 10 RPM. Then also, the big gear is turning 10, but the little gear will be turning 40 RPM. Now, that pulley with the belt on it is also turning 40 RPM, and it goes in there and wraps around a wooden pulley about that big, and you've got 150, 200 RPM. So then you can grind corn. Now, Back when the sawmill was running, they would take the belt off that turns the millstone and go with a belt from here to a little pulley, speed it up, and a whole set of speed up pulleys back to a sawmill blade located where that stake is, and they would go from 10 RPM to 600 RPM. So, but today I don't try to saw logs into lumber. And it was a dangerous place to be because belts were always flying off. Okay, so that's how it works. Okay, so Jack, I think at this point it would be a good time to go ahead and we'll start the water and watch the, we'll get the mill turning and get the wheel turning and we'll go inside the mill and we'll see how we'll show everybody how it works in, and, and you can grind some you can grind some corn okay okay
So we're inside the mill and we can see the uh, uh, it's turning and uh, we've got corn coming down the chute. So uh, why don't you tell us what's going on? Okay. Now then. The parts to the mill, uh, the thing that up there, the box last year, it's called the hopper. Underneath that is a shoe which has a dam sort which shakes the shoe and causes the corn to fall down at a fairly constant rate. Now then. Okay. The names of these things go back to Europe. Now, the hopper, of course, is a pretty common name for anything, but the shoe comes from the Netherlands. Over there, they turn their millstones with the windmills, and they use the Dutchman's little shoe to feed the corn with the tow cut out of it down between. Now, the damsel, the English professor, told me it comes from Shakespeare. Now, the old damsel had a metal offsets on it and it set up a chattering noise. And in Shakespeare, one of his books, he writes about chattering damsels at a discipline. And this guy that was in the audience, he said, that show didn't pay you for that sweat mark. Okay. So what are, we, what, are we, what are we grinding right now? We're grinding cornmeal. And I can tell by the feel when they will make good cornbread. Now then, there are three ways to adjust the metric process. One is the amount of water, you get the water wheel. Right now it's running about 200 RPM and it's turning that runner stone at a, probably 200. Underneath here is a base stone, same size as this one. It's 3 feet in diameter, 18 inches deep, 1200 pounds. Quartz and granite. Same with the bed stone. But on the bottom of the top stone, there's a set of grooves like over there, and on the top of the bottom stone, which doesn't move, it, there's a set of grooves. So it's like a million little pair of scissors that's got that corn in too. Now, you can adjust the amount of corn falling at any given time. Right now, we got it about right. But the most important adjustment of all is a little turnstile right here. And, okay, if I turn it clockwise, I can lift that 1,200 pound mill saw. And that's how I'm able to grind either cornmeal, polenta, or grits. So that's the way it works. Now, we might want to get a shot of the grooves I'll go around those mill stones. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and just turn around and show, show, show everybody the, uh, well, the, 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 those are mill stones smaller than the ones Jack uses, but that's what it looks like. Okay, Jack, now that we've uh, seen the mill and seen how it works and watched the wheel turn and watched the corn grind, why don't you tell us a little more about, uh, first of all, how do we get to this place? People want to come out. Are you here? And can they take a look at it in, in person? Well, we're kind of a little bit in the backwoods, but not very far. We're only four miles from Bakersfield, located on Cane Creek Road. And so if you come in from either east or west or south, whichever way. We have one traffic light in Bakersfield, and to get to Dellinger Grist Mill, you just continue up Cane Creek Road. In Bakersfield, it's called Mitchell uh, 
street, I guess. Mitchell Avenue. Mitchell, Mitchell Avenue. Mitchell Avenue. And just continue four miles. And four miles, you'll see a sign, a Redwood sign, Dellinger Gristmill, National Historic Register. And just come down the access road there. I have a parking lot, gravel, for oh, probably 15, 20 cars. So if, uh, uh, when, what are you at, when are you open? Uh, uh, every Friday and Saturday, we are open to for tours and to grind corn and uh, sell products and just visit and have a good time. Well, let's talk about your products. So this is a grist mill. So do you still grind corn? Yes, I do. And do you sell it? I do. What do you sell? Well, first of all, we've got cornmeal. And this cornmeal will make the best cornbread you ever had in your life. Now, I add nothing to the cornmeal. It comes fresh from corn. And on the back of every bag of cornmeal is a recipe which my mother used to bake cornbread in a wood burning stove. And I miss that cornbread really bad because a wood burning stove gives it extra flavor. So in addition, now that's $10 for about a five pound bag. Now in addition to cornmeal, I also sell grits made from a method that came by my father, being ingenious. Mountain grits will differ quite a bit from flatland grits because they are really finely ground. I sift them until you have nothing but pure grits and they're also $10 a bag. They have two recipes on the back. One is for red-eye gravy grits by, from my mother. And the other one is from a retired attorney who has turned into a real good chef, chef. And he makes the best cheese grits in the world. So his recipe is on the bag also. And that's, 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 that's me we're talking about, just so, <laughs> just so we're clear. Uh, it's cheese grits, and uh, it's, a, it's a good recipe. And, uh, but you can make grits. Jack's grits are really easy to make. Uh, basically, it's, it's a four-to-one ratio, and as long as you mix them cold uh, before you heat them up, you can pretty much make them any way you want. But uh, they're terrific grits. And what else do you grind, Jack? In addition to that, I also learn <laughs> that what we used to call cornmeal mush is now called polenta. And polenta in one of these real fancy restaurants will usually run, run you around 35 bucks. But the polenta I grind and it uses a chef's recipe who runs a fancy restaurant in Atlanta and it's also $10 a bag. And in addition to the meal products, I also have a hat. It's adjustable and it fits anybody. And it's supposed to be a real, really high quality hat according to the artist who does these for me, Barbara Kahn, and now in addition to that, this same artist makes it, well, she orders these t-shirts for me with her design on there, 
and I have all sizes from small to medium to large and extra large which I have on and Bruce has on and so there are plenty of t-shirts okay now in addition to that I wrote a book about the history of my family and the mill and that was along about 2004 and it sells for 20 bucks and it will it will tell you all you ever need to know about a grist mill and about my family. Now in addition to that, I have a card with envelope and all, which is produced from a pen and, pen and pencil drawing by Rolf Holmquist who is an artist, one of the best they've ever had. He, he was originally from Denmark, but now he's here in the United States and lives pretty not far from the mill. Inside the mill and got your price sheet, just so we know. Uh, the, uh, it happens that hats and t-shirts uh, and the book are all $20, and the, the postcard the note card you showed is ten dollars uh, and of course cornmeal grits and polenta is ten dollars as well also I should add that we at the at the historical society office we're selling Jack's book as well so we still have some copies over there and if you want to come by the office you can pick up a copy but the best thing to do is to come by the mill and you'll really enjoy yourself Jack really loves to give tours and will love to show you the mill in operation so Jack I want to thank you very much for uh, showing us around today and uh, this is uh, we're, we're shooting this uh, in August and so you're going to be here this year which is 2020 until when? Until uh, mid-November. Okay so folks uh, if you want to see something that you will not see anywhere else uh you can go to disneyland and you can see their <laughs> their make-believe uh mills and you can go to various places or you can even see mills on the uh, you know at various places but they're run by electric motors this is authentic and this is really this is the real thing so come on by and take a look at it jack will be here and we hope you enjoyed our our, our video tour uh and thanks a lot